I am absolutely delighted to be here, but I have to pinch myself as a set of missionaries born in 1959 in Cochabamba, Bolivia, that I'm here at Mar Al Lago. See, I, I can say it precisely in native Spanish. It truly is a privilege to speak to you tonight. My career started 35 years ago, of which then 33 years of those were spent with CIA. It was 1982, and I'm a graduate student fellow at, uh, in graduate school at, uh, at Georgetown University when I become a fellow at CIA. And there was a, some of you might have known him, Bill Casey. Yeah. Some of you might have heard of Ronald Reagan. Yeah. And I signed up, yes, I was going to a Jesuit school. If you want, it's taught liberation theology and some other very liberal things about Central America. That I could go off and make a difference in the world that remains and was at that time terribly broken. I joined CIA with the intent of going and defeating the Soviet Union. See, because national security, and I believe we have a president-elect today, that truly believes starts with big ideas. Because if you narrowly define what your objectives are, your outcomes will remain extraordinarily narrow. What became known as the Reagan Doctrine shaped my career. And on November 9th, 1989, I had the most glorious day in my 33-year career. In contrast to titles or positions, November 9th, 1989 was the fall of the Berlin Wall. And the start of the unraveling of now the former Soviet Union. That took a couple more years, 1990, 91, 92, you remember Gorbachev, Yeltsin. And that was my motivation. My motivation had a spiritual dimension to it, and that I believe this nation, as a beacon on the hill, could make a difference behind what we call the Iron Curtain at that time. Then a lie started to weave itself into the 1990s. That lie was called the peace dividend. That somehow the world was so much better because the Soviet Union was gone. See, I believe, regardless of whether you're a Republican or Democrat, or Libertarian or anything else, or a non-political active person, that you ultimately will support what you believe in. And by 1995, 1996, 1997, I think you know who was president, the other Clinton, there was this whole idea that defense, national security, and by extension intelligence, to what I dedicated my career to, could actually go down dramatically because that was the peace dividend. How sadly mistaken, and we missed, as a nation, numer numerous messages, including in 1998 in East Africa, in 2000 with the U.S. coal outside of Yemen in the Aden port, we miss the signs, not so much of the day of 9-11 and the events of 9-11-2001. We saw an emergence through that decade before 9-11-2001 that in fact was predictable that what we called Al-Qaeda was emerging. The peace dividend was a lie. See, because what you believe you will ultimately invest in with your time and your treasure with a certain outcome and that belief system 
will determine the direction of our nation. <coughs> it will determine how we assign values to our adversaries. <coughs> it will determine the role that the United States, which I believe is and should remain a beacon on a hill <coughs> to the rest of the world. It was in 2013, I believe on July 21st, if you look at the front page of the New York Times that I am quoted, at the Aspen Security Forum, where would that be in Aspen? <laughs> just, just a quiz. In Aspen. When I was asked the question, what will happen in Syria? And here was my prediction. And I'd love to tell you that I had to get an infinite amount of intelligence cleared in order to say what I said. In fact, I didn't need any of that because I know the condition of the human heart. And it was as follows. At the time, mid-year 2013, so it's coming up on about two years of the insurgency, civil war, the outcome of the Arab Spring of October 2011 in Syria starts nine months, ten months earlier, of course, in Tunisia, and it goes through Libya and all that. This is in Egypt, and it, but this is now in Syria. And here were my two predictions. Out of those 100,000 to 120,000 fighters against Bashar al-Assad in Damascus, the ruler and the butcher of Damascus. 20 to 30,000 of those were prepared to die for their cause. Depending on how you counted them, 60 to 70,000 were there in fact as the opposition because of everything from water rights to other issues that they had with the government including their ethnicity and all that. Here was the prediction. In the absence of external assistance to those 60 to 70,000, the bad guys will continually win. Remember, ISIS did not exist yet other than in its form of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which is the antecedent for ISIS of what we have today. That doesn't come about till June 2014. Notice I didn't predict ISIS. What I had to say about that was people who are prepared to die for their cause, like in Germany, like in Turkey, like in San Bernardino, is a formidable adversary. And they will stop at nothing. They're not the ones that become refugees by and large. Now, they may use the mechanism of the refugee channels. That's a different matter. And so I said over time, not US intervention, any intervention by external forces to support the moderate side, the bad guys at that far end of the, of that spectrum, al-Nusra front and the, the Islamic extremists, and yes, I do name them, will win. Secondly, after World War I, if you look at a map of the Levant, have you ever wondered why there's really straight lines as their borders? It's because the French and the British pulled out a ruler and said, those are the borders. Do you think Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, today's ISIS, cares about those borders? In fact, they're very happy to violate them. And so the second prediction, the first one being the bad guys will get stronger over time, absent external intervention. The second prediction on the front page of the New York Times, Mark Mazzetti, read it, you can go back and Google it, was that in time, the Syria conflict would not stay within its borders. Because it was about the Levant. It was about a caliphate. It was about Raqqa. It was about Mosul. It was about going back into Ambar. It was about going to Nineveh and into those areas that I know so well from my own past and service of multiple trips into those areas. 
So you see, intelligence and national security and ultimately what you believe have a material impact on others. <laughs> I had the privilege of serving from Lincoln's birthday 2001 to late May 2005 in the George W. Bush White House as the Senior Director for Intelligence. What I learned about the Oval Office, if any of you have been in it or had the privilege of doing a tour of it in whatever form, you might have noticed there's two doors into the <coughs> two primary doors into the Oval Office. This will come as an intelligence surprise to you, a front door and a back door. <laughs> sort of reminds you of something in your house. The people that come through the front door I started to observe come in generally as the, uh, the, the leadership of other countries, our political leadership in our own country, when they're visitors. And over time, I concluded that when I gave the intelligence briefing to George W. Bush and Vice President Cheney and the assembled national security individuals, which happened on a daily basis, was that the people who came in the front door saw the world as they wish it were, they wish it would be. The people that came in the back door, like myself, generally, as a rule, told the audience in that room as the world really is. See, the role of intelligence, and frankly, it's been somewhat skewed over the last several years, is to speak that truth to the power figures, the president, the vice president, the national security cabinet members, what their options are in the kind of world that I described in Syria. See, this is connected to my story of July 2013. And as I think ahead of what the president-elect will face, along with his cabinets, the, the cabinet members of people I know well, like General Mattis and General Kelly, because of my time at the Defense Intelligence Agency, great men, by the way, great people. Uh, I call them warrior scholars. They will do great things for our nation. When I think of others who are part of that national security cabinet as it comes together like Mike Pompeo. I'm convinced that they will have the courage to come through that back door and say, Mr. President, you may wish the world to be this way. Your constituency may want the world to be this way, but with all due respect, the world is this as opposed to that. That's an uncomfortable position to be in. But that's the kind of courage that's required in talking to the individuals when you present them with options, informed by intelligence. Intelligence doesn't make the decision. Good intelligence is only helpful to the degree that it speaks the truth in bringing options to the decision maker. I lived through the period in the White House of our invasion into Iraq in March of 2003. We know that by late that year, certainly by early 2004, we had a massive intelligence, and yes, I use it bluntly, failure on our hands. CIA, the NSA, the alphabet soup, as I affectionately call them, and the intelligence community failed us. The very community I love so dearly, the very agency I love so dearly, there was no weapons of mass destruction, certainly not in the way that it was projected in making the case for war in January and February of 2003. So you see, intelligence informing decisions 
And the weight that you give that information materially matters in a dramatic way. To include ignoring it, partially using it, or using it entirely. So it will not surprise you if I stand here before you and make a strong case for strong defense and then ultimately the first line of defense, a very strong intelligence capability for our nation. And oh, how I would love that to be apolitical. That's not a political statement. Our first line of defense that either prevents the war that we do not wish to send our young sons and daughters to, or the intelligence that decisively wins the war, should that be the only option. That's what intelligence is for. And that application is everybody's much against the terrorist threats that we face, because, and I'll say it here again, we are at war with them. It's an asymmetrical war. That it is, it's, it's a war that doesn't have the tanks and the battlefields that are the traditional form. And then we have our adversaries that are nation states, that the idea is to prevent the war because of good intelligence while still having the defense capacity in the event that you go to war and then win, win decisively. So you see the balance that the president-elect inherit from a standpoint of his national security capabilities is absolutely critical. And in my view, those have eroded dramatically over the last uh, number of years. So let me just spend in closing on how I view the world. I always struggle when I speak, I think I have to be close to this, or like a Latino, I, I just wander. <laughs> I use my hands a lot. There's no Italian in me, but there is the Latin. I'm not going to go through a litany of hot spots in the world. I'm happy to take questions about what do I think of the Supreme Leader in Iran versus the, the, the Gulf countries and, and the Arab balance of Shia and Sunni. That's, that's all fine. The problem is I think you want to go home tonight. <laughs> and you probably want dinner in between. So I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to posit tonight is a world that I think the new administration faces in broad strokes that will be a challenge for whomever would occupy the Oval Office and become our next administration. It just happens to be the president-elect Donald Trump. So here's the world that I see. I told you that 1982, I go into CIA, it's a bipolar world. You're either with the Soviets and the Warsaw Pact and that side of things, or you were with the exception of maybe Switzerland that was neutral, but it was sort of with us. Even Switzerland was with you. That was the divide. You're either with the Marxist Communist Soviet Union or you were with the United States. A cleaner world in terms of the divide. That's gone. And it's not coming back. The world of today and of the immediate future with cyber crossing it in terms of capabilities, with terrorism in an international manner crossing it in cross cuts is as follows. There are going to be three areas of the world around which the dramatic pivots of issues, alliances, breaking of alliances, will face us. Start, I'll come back to the United States role in that. Those three are Russia and Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping in China and East Asia, and the United States. Did you notice where my hand was? Russia. China, the United States. But it's not Russia, China, the United States, or United States, China, Russia. We're in the middle. Our engagements in East Asia and the Pacific Rim, 
with our allies such as Japan and South Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, Indonesia, Thailand, I'm sure I'm leaving them off, all have to do with the China relationship. How China builds the fake islands and territories in the East and South China Seas off of the shoals of the Philippines and other places. That's where we're going to be taking the task. See, and think what you may of a trade deal, and I don't know the in intimate details on the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, draft, but whatever space is left with the withdrawal will get filled by the Chinese. Again, that's not an endorsement or a rejection of the trade path. It's viewing the world as the Chinese see it and their objective goals are predetermining how we need to respond or we need to get ahead of those actions by the Chinese. I'm a strong, extraordinarily strong advocate for a, relation, a strong relationship with Prime Minister Modi in India for that very reason. I'm a strong advocate of working still with Pakistan as difficult as a partner as it is on counterterrorism and other interests that the United States have because I see it through the lens of China. And understanding China's objectives are absolutely critical. Russia. I start with the premise, and I truly believe intelligence supports this, that every chessboard move that Vladimir Putin, a former KGB officer, does, along with his oligarch circle of friends, so they're not anymore, by the way. <laughs> he takes care of his friends, so they're not, in very interesting ways. Every move he makes, including Syria and Latakia and where he went in and the proverbial red line and the space he was given there, is directly tied to his domestic objectives. And that's driven by restoring Mother Russia to some status of grandeur. How, how many of you say back in the day when it was really, I'm still wondering what Russia's greatness was. <laughs> but from his perspective, it's far more czarist, as in pre-1917, than the Soviet Union. I'm not looking for hammers and sickles with Putin. That's not his objective at all. His objective is sheer power that enables him to stay in power inside Russia. And that restoration of that grandeur, that restoration of a, an embarrassed and shamed defeat, defeated enemy from the st standpoint of the United States defeating the Soviet Union is what he is all about. So when you look at the world chessboard, I then have to see our partnership with our 28 countries in NATO through that lens. I have to see with uh, Chancellor Merkel, and on whatever day it is that the Prime Minister is by whatever name in Italy that way as well. <laughs> it changes often. This one to another change. I have to see Brexit through the lens of how Russia sees. See, because Europe is its back door. And its self-interest is absolutely to divide NATO. And they, they have developed an art form in psychological operations and information operations that have a, a strong cyber component to it to divide and conquer <coughs> NATO. And it's happening to us as we, as we sit there and I stand before you. So the, you, you take, you watch, watch the news in the next, this is highly predictable, watch the news in the next 48 hours to 96 hours, four to five days, on what Putin does about the Russian ambassador being shot by his own bodyguard, the, the Turkish bodyguard on the whole issue of the level. He will respond in that in the cold-hearted manner that's in the self-interest of drawing Turkey 
further into the orbit of Russia and away from NATO. If there's a breakaway country that I fear is going to break out from NATO, it's Turkey under Erdogan. I promise I wasn't going to talk about individual countries, but I will use them as anecdotes against these major pivoting areas of the world in terms of what intelligence and our national security needs to better understand. These are strategic thoughts and strategic concepts around which to understand day-to-day -day events in the world. Notice, it's not about the predictive nature, will Putin fly to Ankara to go do that? It's what drives the relationship between the former Ottoman Empire with the former Russian Empire closer together. And you need to understand that then as, as a national security framework in order to develop your own strategy toward these dimensions of world events. So that's the essence of it. So where is the United States in all this? I'm sure everybody in here, if you haven't done it with yourself, you have a mate at some point in your life that has told you this, you're so negative. <laughs> you're so glass half empty. <laughs> My wife likes to say of me, I'm generally a glass half full. I look to see for opportunities as opposed to pessimism. So let me end on a couple of high notes. The world, generically speaking, is pleading for the United States to lead again. visit ministers of defense in the Middle East region, when I met, meet the ministers of defense, including in places like Vietnam, Cambodia, and elsewhere, even in those smaller places, they're pleading, where is the United States? So the upbeat note in the glass half full is we have a willing partnership. People don't want to be subjugated to the Chinese. They don't want to be subjugated to the Russian influence, subjugated in the sense of spheres of influence. Do you think Eastern Europe wants to go back? Do you think, as I affectionately call it, the stands all across the Caucasus all want to be in the orbit of Moscow telling them what to do? They're looking for our leadership. Secondly, we have to come to a realization that technology and communications is never going back to what it was. What do I mean by that? The cost point, for those who are former or current business people will understand exactly what I mean. The cost point, as I, as I term it, has gone to 7-Eleven or Radio Shack. It, Radio Shack doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> but I can say it. It's like I can say, is it real or is it Memorex? And you say that to a 25-year-old, they have no idea. <laughs> so technology in the world that we're in is a great opportunity. But we have to be very realistic about it. Drones are going to be available at a cost point to adversaries that we never could even, we don't even know how to name them, let alone that they're organized in the manner that we would, we would understand. Them. The way communications are is that instantly, as you well know, you can have messaging around the globe. You have an 85% of the internet that is below the surface called the dark net, where really, really bad stuff happens. Those are opportunities for an intelligence officer. That is an opportunity to find and to penetrate those circles of bad stuff and disrupt them. See, and so technology and communications are as every bit as much, depending how you look at it, your friend, as well as your adversary's use of it, your enemy. How does this, how does this materially play out for you? 
it plays out in that you have to design strategies that then embrace different ways of using communications and technologies than we traditionally done. And I think we have elected, as a nation, a president who knows about that. And so probably because I'm getting the hook from Celeste, <laughs> I was told I was going to see her star come down. That's because of Italians. I, and the Italians beat the Bolivians, so. <laughs> Um, I just closed on an upbeat note. Yes, we live in a horrifically fallen world, broken world, enormous challenges, the kind of world that's multilateral in terms of those interests, very, very dynamic. But I do believe America can lead again and to use an oft-repeated refrain, make America great again.